Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're viewing this live stream. My name is Nancy Lindborg, and I am the president and CEO of the U.S. Institute of Peace. And I know there are viewers joining us from all around the world. We're delighted to have all of you here with us today for a very timely and important discussion. We're honored to have with us His Excellency Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, who has taken time at this very critical moment in the Afghan peace process to share how he and the High Council for National Reconciliation are preparing for talks with the Taliban. After the keynote address, we'll have a Q&A session moderated by USIP's Vice President for Asia, Dr. Andrew Wilder. And we invite you to, to take part in this event by asking a question through the YouTube live stream in the comments section. And you can also engage with us and with each other on Twitter with today's hashtag Afghan peace. At USIP, supporting a sustainable peace process in Afghanistan has been a core priority. And I'm encouraged that in recent months, there has been progress towards direct inter-Afghan negotiations. Um, at the same time, violence is rising to unprecedented levels, uh, including increasing and quite disturbing numbers of civilian capacities. And there are other challenges. COVID-19 has exacerbated the struggles that Afghans face, um, including contributing to increased food insecurity and extreme poverty. But despite these challenges, developments over the past few weeks have created momentum to get the peace process to the essential next phase of inter-Afghan talks. This was facilitated in part by the signing of a political agreement between President Ash Ashraf Ghani and Chairman Abdullah, resolving disputes over the 2019 presidential election. So as part of the agreement, Chairman Abdullah has been appointed chair of the newly established High Council for Na National Reconciliation, which will oversee the talks with the Taliban, as well as Afghanistan's collective efforts on peace. And with reports indicating that preliminary talks between the Islamic Republic in Afghanistan and the Taliban could begin during the coming weeks, today's discussion could not come at a better time. We look forward to hearing Chairman Abdullah share with us how he, the High Council for National Reconciliation and the Afghan negotiating team are preparing for a truly historic moment. Chairman Abdullah Abdullah served as the Chief Executive of Afghanistan from September 2014 until March 20, 2020. He also served as the First Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan from 2001 to 2005. Prior to the formation of the Islamic Republic, Chairman Abdullah served in many capacities in the government of the Islamic State of Afghanistan, including as Foreign Minister. And he also served as an advisor to the Mujahideen commander Ahmad Shah Massoud. So obviously many, many years of experience. Uh, and so with that, we are delighted to welcome you uh, to, the, to this program this morning, this evening. And I'm delighted to invite His Excellency Chairman Abdullah Abdullah to provide his keynote address. Thank you so much, Chairman Abdullah. Uh, thank you, President Lemberg. Uh, and USIP for providing this opportunity. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I appreciate the efforts by USIP and all our friends across the globe uh, for joining us uh, this New Age webinar to share some thoughts about the opportunities and challenges for negotiations with the Taliban. Uh, I cannot emphasize more on the significance of the opportunity today and now, 40 years after the start of the war in conflict in Afghanistan. Allow me first of to acknowledge the millions of Afghans who yearn for peace and who deserve to live in peace with honor and with their citizens' rights guaranteed under the law after more than 40 years of conflict and to remember and salute the tens of thousands who have fallen or continue to be victims of anti-peace entities and terror groups. I also want to pay tribute 
to the men and women from across the world, Americans in particular, who paid the ultimate price, either served or, or currently serving uh, to their nations with honor as part of post 9-11 mission. 20 years later, there are many lessons to be drawn from the past. Afghans and Americans share a unique history, but our bonds during the last chapter of the Cold War, when Afghans resisted a devastating invasion, and then again in our fight against international terrorism, which continues to this day, became, became stronger. Today, we are taking stock of good and bad of the past 40 years or four decades and look at the road ahead. We are at the threshold, at the threshold between a unique opportunity for peace that is being defined as we speak or continuing the war, the cost of war, the agony of war with less clarity into the future. And given our geography, an existing threat assessment, it's not just about Afghanistan. It's also about the stability, connectivity, security from Far East to Europe and beyond. The threat of terrorism has receded in some ways, but has taken on new forms in other ways. Uh, as far as preparations for the talks are concerned, we decided in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, together with President Ghani, that we put no preconditions for the start of negotiations, and our negotiating team is well prepared to start negotiations at any time. Uh, we, uh, with so much negative news uh, around lately, let me start with some positive uh, news that I hope is a sign for more to come. A few hours ago, uh, Gandahara News Service reported that in interviews across the country with recently freed Taliban prisoners and Afghan government soldiers, most have expressed desire to live peacefully with their families. My message to the Taliban is, a few may decide to join other fighters, but that's not the right decision. The collective call of the Afghan people, the majority of the Afghans for peace, should be embraced by all of us. And both sides now have to remove the remaining obstacles and move towards talks in an intra-Afghan outcome that takes all our realities into account. The current opportunity, why I call it an opportunity? Because majority of the Afghans are supportive of the peace efforts and also all our partners led by the United States, but other partners as well, uh, are supportive of the peace process. The current opportunity for starting a peace process is historically unique. It's not perfect, nor will it be an easy exercise. We need to be realistic about our means, the deep divides, the anger and hurt uh, that need healing, the political roadblocks, the opportunistic and the spoiler behaviors, as well as expectations and shared interests. A key challenge will be to keep the process inclusive, representative and focused, yet flexible, and always seeking solutions and compromises at each step leading to realistic outcomes that all Afghans can own. The peace dividend also has to be worked out and discussed with all international, internal and international stakeholders, while we need to make sure that our country is no longer going to be a hub or a staging ground for international terrorism. At this stage, we are working on an integrated roadmap that can energize the process and keep us on track by addressing the prerequisite conditions uh, agreed to by various stakeholders. They include the more obvious goal of releasing the prisoners, which uh, has taken place in the past few days and weeks, and hopefully it will be completed soon. 
getting the technicality sorted out to have negotiating team ready for talks. I mean, as I mentioned, uh, our team is ready. Maximizing the impact of violence reduction measures in addressing COVID-19 needs through healthcare services, key demands of the Afghan public across front lines, keeping the region constructively engaged in preventing spoilers from derailing or stalling the momentum that has been created. Since we all agree that there is no military solution, in the current mutually hurting stalemate is unsustainable, given the number of factors at play inside Afghanistan, in the region, and with other global priorities like the pandemic or the upcoming American elections. We have no option but to aim for talks leading to a political settlement that can be owned and embraced by Afghans across the social and political spectrum. Let me clearly say that there is no justification, religious or political, for the staggering loss of Afghan lives across the battlefields in our villages, towns, cities, in the valleys, deserts, in road checkpoints, or in our mosques, or even hospitals. Some food for thought from somebody who has uh, been intimately involved with Afghan affairs since its, its uh, young ages, since my youth. Uh, and uh, I am reminded uh, constantly uh, that uh, just Kabul or downtown Kabul uh, or a small elite with the specific priorities with whom foreign and government officials usually interact. Uh, this is not the whole Afghanistan. That's, it is why I always try to detach myself from any bubble and try to understand the vast and complex reality, the demographic facts, the role of youth, the women, women but also large and small communities in the villages across our diverse landscape. If we are to come up with an inclusive and comprehensive peace settlement, we need to talk, listen, negotiate, compromise, and come up with a common, implementable, and acceptable end state that involves different layers that represent all key sides, including women, youths, and victims of war, and is not seen as a threat to any external powers. We have a choice either to make this process easy and less painful for our people and others, or more complicated than it is by dragging it and adding to the pain, loss of lives, poverty and cost. It's also an economic and security choice. We can reduce the costs while reducing the level of violence, displacement, migration, and managing the threat of terrorism and illicit activities, or keep the fire burning and cope with the fallout of more war at a time when there is resource scarcity, a pandemic, and other preoccupations on the global radar screen. This is a process with many variables and layers. It is tied to the US Taliban deal, which means with political decisions in several capitals, as well as the situation on the ground where people die in territories are contested. It has historic Afghan roots, but it's also connected to our region in geopolitical and geoeconomic interests. It has important humanitarian and stability component. Finally, there are values, ideas, and rights involved that need a deep discussion within a traditional Afghan and a scholarly Islamic context. This is why it is not and cannot be a one-man or one-faction endeavor. It requires broad political will, engagement, consultation, coordination, and action. The process
I think uh, the microphone was not on for a, for a second. I will go through the uh, paragraph. This is why it is not and cannot be a one man or one faction endeavor. It requires political will, engagement, consultation, coordination, and action. The process will also need to go through phases, and each phase has its own give and take to facilitate transitions and forward mobility that can be verifiable and implementable. Following the political agreement signed in May with President Ghani, I have been busy taking practical steps to open lines of communications, consulting with key stakeholders, and strengthening the consensus that is needed in coordinating with internal and external actors. However, not everything is in our hand, even though it has been agreed that the High Council for National Reconciliation is the vehicle through which we are going to bring all the elements together and define the policy lines for implementation. Failing to do so will further weaken the hands of those who believe in an inclusive, united, pluralistic, and value-based end state. Within the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, we have come to a conclusion that we should present a unified voice in support of peace and also preserving the values which have, our people have made sacrifices for it. Ready to start talks, ready to make compromises, ready to move forward for an end state which works for all, a country which lives in peace within and without, unified, democratic, and respects the rights of its own people. We need to be nimble by responsibly moving the process forward, while we need to be focused and prepared to defend the values that matter the most to the plurality of our people. Now that peace process has been initiated, we need to remind ourselves that there is no going back. We need to work together, Afghans, with Americans, our partners, our neighbors, to fight for a just peace and durable stability. Uh, I'll stop here uh, to engage in discussions and I thank you again for the opportunity. Excellency Chairman Abdullah, thank you very much for your informative remarks uh, and for taking the time to join us today. I wish we could be hosting you in person at USIP, um, but the silver lining of these virtual events uh, is that we have a much larger global audience. <clears throat> um, I'm going to start off with a few questions and then we'll open it up and take questions from the hundreds of individuals watching online today. Um, as Nancy Limborg mentioned, we invite all our viewers to take part in this discussion by asking questions through the YouTube uh, comment section. Um, and you can also join uh, the discussion and with us as well as with each other on Twitter with using the hashtag Afghan peace. Um, as Nancy mentioned, and, and as you also mentioned, this discussion comes at a critical time for Afghanistan. Given the reports of shockingly high increases in violence, even in the last week, um, a devastating pandemic, you know, adding further misery and hardship for millions of Afghanistan, uh, but also the uncertainty about the time frame for U.S. troop presence or withdrawal. Uh, but at the same time, as you mentioned, it's a time of opportunity. I think it sounds like we might be closer to intra-Afghan talks um, than ever before. Um, and, and with it, the hope that there would be at least a reduction of violence and the start of difficult negotiations to end the four decades of conflict in Afghanistan. Um, so Chair Chairman Abdullah, you have long, as Nancy mentioned in her introduction, uh, been involved in Afghan war politics and diplomacy uh, from a young ed, ed, you know, age as an advisor to Ahmed Shah Massoud during the resistance of the Soviet occupation during the 1980s, uh, during the civil war of the 1990s. And then as the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan's first foreign minister, and then most recently for six years as the chief executive. Um, um, you have seen many ups and downs and you know given afghanistan's history maybe more downs than ups um 
But I'm wondering if you could just look back over the last four decades in which you were an active participant in Afghanistan's history. And again, how would you characterize this moment? You touched a bit, a bit on it in your remarks just now. But again, if you could get, give us a little bit more information on how you would characterize this specific moment in Afghanistan's history. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, yourself about the challenges uh, that the country is faced with. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, we are uh, uh, faced with an opportunity. Uh, the opportunity is that uh, I'm here as a citizen and also as a chairman uh, and I've worked in the government in the past and working uh, together with the government today for pursuit of uh, peace process, I see that there is an opportunity. Uh, the people of Afghanistan, the absolute majority of the people of Afghanistan want a peaceful settlement. Four decades of war does not mean that we, 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 cannot, we cannot solve it. It, it, it should, it should, it should uh, compel all of us to look back and to, to come to a conclusion that there is no military solution for the war. Uh, and that, that takes more than one side. At the same time, I, have, I do have concerns. I, well, I'm optimistic, and I, I think that once, as Afghans, we get across the table and, and raise the issues, very difficult issues, which we have fought over uh, for, for, for many years now, and, 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 and see, and, and also look at the suffering of our people and the continued suffering of our people, uh, I see an opportunity there. But if there is a thinking, uh, in the other side, uh, and hopefully that's not the case, uh, that the U.S. troops may withdraw and we may not have uh, to, to come to a settlement we might overcome by force, uh, that will be a mistake, a grave mistake. That will be another missed opportunity for the Afghans. In the same way that in 90, we could not make peace within the country, there were a lot of factors. But at the same time, we missed out an opportunity and then uh, we, are, we were witness to another two and a half decades of war. Uh, so I hope that nobody, has, nobody will make that mistake. But there is no doubt uh, that uh, extremely challenging time, lots of hopes for the people, lots of concerns as well, not only in terms of the continuation of the war, but the people are also concerned what happens to their, to their rights, what happens to their liberties and so on and so forth. But meanwhile, there is a lot of support for, uh, for, for the peace process uh, and inclusivity right from the beginning up to the end is important and critical. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to, not, my next question, come back to the issue of violence. And you talked about, you know, quite rightly, there's no excuse for violence now. Um, and yet, despite the initial hopes that reduced levels of violence would be sustained following the ceasefire, uh, over Eid in late May, um, you know, it appears that violence has ramped up, dramatic, ramped up dramatically across the country, even just during the last week um, as we approach talks. Um, the Afghan National Security Council spokesperson announced last week uh, it was the deadliest for Afghan security forces in 19 years, with 422 Taliban attacks in 32 provinces, killing 291 ANDSF members and wounding 550 others. I mean, those are shocking statistics. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit about how, how can talks proceed with such high levels of violence and what can be done to ensure that the current spike of violence doesn't derail the talks? That's a, a serious uh, challenge, the continuation of the level of violence that we have been witness to especially in the past few weeks. Uh, we have communicated through different channels uh, to the Taliban, uh, to our partners uh, and uh, different countries which have leverages uh, that uh, while uh, we, we, have, uh, we are serious in pursuit of uh, uh, talks and also preparing the ground for negotiations and also expediting the exchange of prisoners, in spite of the challenges which were involved in it. At the same time, uh, the continuation of the current level of violence, uh, which is not justified uh, uh, at all, uh, it, it makes the people worry. 
in extremely concern that uh, uh, where are we leading if, you, if there are steps taken uh, in order to build confidence and to facilitate for the start of the negotiations while well, the level of con uh, uh, violence is increased uh, increasingly, uh, that makes the political environment uh, very difficult. I hope that everybody gets that uh, message uh, and, uh, and that puts uh, our seriousness in pursuit of peace process uh, into test. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the aim is that uh, we, we, should, we, should, we, should, we should achieve peace and security for all Afghans and should, should, should live in peace uh, within and without. Uh, we should show signs of, we should show signs of seriousness, seriousness right from the beginning and this is the time for it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to move on to getting to intra-Afghan negotiations. I mean, a few weeks ago, there were reports that intra-Afghan talks may start by the end of June. Um, you know, with less than a week left in June, that now seems maybe unlikely, but could you tell us what you think, intra when you think intra-Afghan talks might begin, you know, what is delaying them and how specific obstacles in the intra-Afghan talks in the path of the intra-Afghan talks will be resolved. And I think in particular to address, you, you talked about the prisoner issue, which we know is one of the real significant obstacles in getting to talks. If you can give us a status update, you know, on the release of Taliban prisoners, uh, but also whether the Taliban are holding up on their end of the bargain to release ANDSF prisoners. And then secondly, more specifically, what is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic you know, on the ability of negotiating teams to travel and negotiate in person? The, uh, as far as uh, prisoners' release is concerned, 75% of the, from the list which Taliban have provided to us have been released. And also uh, uh, a few hundred from the list that we had provided for the Talib to the Taliban of our own security forces, uh, those also have been have been released. Uh, we have our uh, uh, Taliban team, uh, technical team, which is working on the issue of prisoners, are in Kabul currently and working together with our own team in order to expedite the process. Uh, and then comes the: there are no other conditions or preconditions. This was one of the things that Taliban were emphasizing that uh, the uh, up to 5,000 uh, uh, Taliban prisoners needs to be released before the start of negotiations. And we are very close to that. Uh, at the same time, the technical issues of uh, getting there, sending teams there, the Taliban team are in Doha. Uh, the uh, requirements of, uh, of uh, uh, having the people tested here, the negotiating team, uh, they are continuing uh, as we as we get closer to the date. Uh, the the negotiating team uh, have been tested, uh, uh, and uh, that will be repeated before their departure uh, towards Doha as well. Should it uh, should it uh, happen? At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, reduction in violence. Uh, where does it get us if we, if the current level of violence continues in the same way as it is, and then the people leave Kabul in order to start talks, but uh, with the with the news of hundreds of people being killed recently as a result of violence, including uh, including uh, uh, civilians, uh, that will not be a good environment for the start of negotiations. While we have not put preconditions for the start of the talks, but we think that it's also for the other side to look at it as it is. If we are to solve this issue uh, permanently forever uh, and, and reach a peaceful settlement, we all need to take steps that, show, that shows and proves that uh, uh, we are serious. So the technical issues will be there, COVID-19, it will not be like normal when people leave here for two, for, uh, two or three first days, they need to communicate virtually, 
before their their test is negative again uh, in the in the uh, in Doha. So there are all those sorts of technical issues uh, which are involved. Uh, but uh, uh, we can use the time either virtually and later on face to face talks uh, with the, with the, with the Taliban, and, 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 and we are prepared for that. Conditions and our, our team is, is, is prepared at the moment. Thank you. I think we're all learning that we can do much more virtually than we thought before. So uh, let's hope, including with negotiations. Um, um, I wanted to, you had mentioned in your talk also the, you know, the, the importance of keeping the process inclusive, uh, representative, open, and flexible. Um, and I wanted to just come back to the issue of inclusion. Um, because as you know, studies have shown that peace processes that are not inclusive are more likely to fail. Um, and I know that many Afghans, and in particularly women and minority groups, are concerned that, that the gains that have been achieved over the past 20 years will end up as concession, concessions in a political agreement uh, with the Taliban. So what will you and the negotiating team and the High Council for National Reconciliation do to ensure that women and minority groups will be an integral part of the process and to protect the rights and gains since 2002. First of all, they will be uh, part of the negotiating team uh, while uh, talking about the common values for the majority of the people of Afghanistan. Uh, men and women of the country are for those uh, values, for the rights of the people, women's rights and, uh, and values which we have made sacrifices for. Uh, and also in the leadership committee for the uh, High Council for National Reconciliation and also in the General Assembly, we make sure that the women uh, groups are, are uh, um, uh, it's inclusive of all sections of the society, including women and uh, youth and, and uh, uh, minorities. Uh, and uh, also uh, in the negotiating, uh, around the negotiating table. Uh, the, while uh, uh, I'm not in favor of like uh, putting red lines right from the beginning, but uh, when we go there, Taliban will have their own uh, uh, issues, uh, which uh, they will be very tough uh, on negotiating on them. Uh, we will have uh, issues which uh, which is uh, uh, which uh, which is uh, part of the rights of our people, and and nobody will. Uh, will 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 be, uh, and we cannot achieve peace with with sac sacrificing the basic and fundamental rights of our people. But at the same time, if you could get to a situation that uh, uh, that uh, uh, while uh, we have different views and very different views, when I say different views, it's it's not like a difference between. Uh, nine and ten. It's it's uh, on on certain issues uh, uh, we are far apart. Uh, but uh, um, uh, we should be able to maintain the different views amongst ourselves, uh, fight for it politically, not through violence, but at the same time agree to live together uh, uh, within a country uh, and, and, and make peace and rebuild uh, our uh, country. At the same time, I can assure you that the uh, civil society is very active uh, they, while they are uh, uh, as keen as anybody, any other group uh, in the society uh, in order to uh, achieve peace, but at the same time uh, in, in, uh, uh, in working together with us, which we are working with them, with different um, uh, groups, uh, they, they want to make sure that those, the negotiating team uh, uh, is, not in, is inclusive uh, in, in terms of its composition, but at the same time, in, ter in terms of pluralistic uh, uh, society that we have and, and diversity and represent the diverse views of our people uh, at the same time, uh, uh, at, at the same time uh, work for the interests of all Afghans. Uh, so those concerns are real. We hear it uh, days in and, in and, in and out. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, we, are, uh, we are engaging these groups within the country as well, uh, and uh, COVID-19 has made life easier for us. Uh, otherwise, part of my initial thinking was that uh, should we start with the uh, with the with the uh, with my work in, as the chair uh, chairman in the council, uh, we need to we need to travel around the 
uh, around the country uh, in, in, in listen to the people then talk to the people, uh, assure them and also learn from them, uh, uh, see how keen they are uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in their ideas for peace in peaceful country and at the same time uh, assure them that, uh, that uh, their fundamental rights will not be compromised. Thank you. I got one follow-up question to that, and then I, I'll turn it over to, uh, I'll start transitioning to questions from our audience. Um, but you rightly pointed out, I mean, I think the pluralism that, you know, on your side, I think the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan's negotiating team, you know, has the advantage of being more pluralistic, inclusive, and politically diverse, uh, you know, representing the diversity of Afghanistan um, and its members. Um, and whereas the Taliban pretty much have an all-male negotiating team that doesn't seem very necessarily inclusive and representative. Um, uh, so, but with this di diversity, nearly by definition, you know, comes a much wider range of, of you know, perspectives and issues. And I'm wondering how you and, you know, the, the High Council for National Reconciliation and the negotiating team will achieve consensus and maintain unity in talks with the Taliban. Uh, so just that tension between the advantages of being much more diverse and representative of Afghanistan and the Islamic Republic side, but also the challenges that brings in terms of, in a negotiating uh, context. We have, uh, uh, we have a common goal. Uh, the team uh, are, uh, uh, have a shared interest uh, in, 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 in pursuit of uh, uh, the peace process. Uh, that's one. Uh, and, and next to that is that uh, there are, uh, while uh, we re the team represent different political entities, civil society, uh, different walks of life, different ethnic groups uh, in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, but uh, they represent the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan uh, in the values shared there. So it's a... Uh, 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 it will be it will be also an opportunity for Taliban to see that people uh, which uh, which had different points of views at different times, different political stance. Sometimes they are fought against one another, but at the same time uh, they represent shared values for the country, uh, and they have come together uh, and uh, they talk to us uh, and they want to be uh, to become friends uh, uh, and and also as citizens. Uh, uh, working together uh, in a peace for peaceful Afghanistan, uh, so it will be it will be uh, an experience, uh, a new experience for the Taliban as well. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I have no doubt in my mind that being diverse, uh, still uh, they share those core values, uh, and they will represent it around the table. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to start off with. Uh, you know, questions from the audience and maybe starting with two questions from the media, um, which I'm going to lump together as they're both sort of regarding U.S. troop actions um, and the possibility of withdrawal. Um, so Courtney Cuby from NBC asks, is the U.S. military doing enough to protect the Afghan security forces that continue to come under attack from the Taliban? Do you think they should be doing more and if they're holding back, is it to salvage the peace process? Uh, so that's the first question. And then the second one is from BBC's uh, Pakistan Afghanistan correspondent, Sikandar Karmani, who asks, the US Taliban deal makes clear a full withdrawal next year is contingent on the intra-Afghan talks beginning, but not concluding. Given those talks are likely to last a long time, are you concerned about the possibility of U.S. forces pulling out before you have reached an agreement with the Taliban? Wouldn't that severely damage your position in the negotiations? In terms of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, presence in Afghanistan and also U.S. command, uh, General Miller, which is working with our uh, uh, security institutions, defense and security institutions, uh, they are working very closely together. They are mindful of the agreement signed between the United States and Taliban uh, in terms of uh, the engagement of the, uh, the U.S. troops in Afghanistan in the conditions that it sets for it. Uh, at the same time, the cooperation 
uh, continues. Uh, they are also, uh, uh, our international partners are also concerned about the increased level of violence. Uh, and uh, uh, we all understand that uh, it's, uh, it, it puts under question uh, sustainability of hoping for, for, getting, for, for, for getting to the ne negotiating table. So the level of cooperation is there. There are some restrictions currently, but if, 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 the, uh, um, uh, if, the, if those, uh, uh, le those conditions are not observed by all sides, especially Taliban, uh, uh, they, will, uh, uh, they will have to uh, revisit what could be done in that, under those circumstances. But currently, we all jointly uh, of the view, uh, of a common view, that the level of violence is, is increased and it's not good. Uh, but the cooperation between uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, troops in Afghanistan and our uh, defense and security forces uh, continues. In terms of uh, U.S. withdrawal, a withdrawal date, there is, uh, it is condition-based. There are other conditions as well, including uh, the presence of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other troops and the way to deal with it, and, and also Afghanistan, Afghanistan Afghanistan not being uh, uh, a base for terrorist groups which poses a threat for our citizens as well as our international partners. Uh, so uh, the uh, presence of U.S. troops in Afghanistan are condition-based uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we all look at it as an opportunity rather than taking advantage of it. When, when the U.S. signed an agreement and also uh, uh, expressed its willing to, to withdraw from Afghanistan when those conditions are met, uh, we, we need to look at it as an opportunity for all Afghans rather than uh, trying to taking, uh, take advantage of it uh, for the sake of one group. Uh, hopefully that's not the thinking uh, with the Taliban. And also uh, the people of uh, uh, Afghanistan are also watching uh, and they are making judgments about uh, uh, our uh, uh, commitment. Uh, the, the people as a whole, while uh, uh, on the, if, if we take the example of the uh, prisoners exchange, uh, as a whole the, there were no protests against it as such. There were concerns expressed about it. But if, if the same thing continues, with the current level of violence, then the people will uh, will question us uh, uh, and put us under question. And also, uh, uh, in regards to, to to the to 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 the question of the U.S. withdrawal, while the talks uh, will continue, if we come to an agreement during the talks, that uh, we will uh, in, in we show uh, our commitment uh, to 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 concluding an agreement for the interest of all Afghans. And then it's part of that agreement between the Afghans that we are, uh, both sides are sure that, uh, that uh, the presence of the international troops will not be needed beyond certain point while the United States will, de will decide for itself. We can express our, our, our joint view in that common view. And that will be a good, a, a good sign uh, in, 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 in a big progress. Uh, but uh, most of these things will will be uh, will be uh, tested uh, as the talks start, uh, and and uh, we are looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask two more questions lumped together on sort of the issue of trade-offs in a peace negotiation. Um, Muhammad Tahir asks, "How do you envision the future of the current Afghan government under a peace agreement?" as well as the role of the Taliban in a future administration. And then relatedly, uh, Mr. J, sorry, JJ Bajer asks, what compromises with regard to the political system is the Afghan delegation ready to make in order to reach a peace agreement? Again, in regards to earlier question, uh, uh, and I also mentioned in my remarks that there is no military solution. Uh, there were times that Taliban were in control of 90% of the country, but that didn't mean the end of war. 
if, even if the, there is a, a, a premature uh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, that does not mean that Taliban can take over the whole country. That's, that's the, if there is one lesson in the past four decades, that should be that lesson. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully no sides are aiming for the continuation of the war. Uh, so that's uh, that's in, in regard to to the to the uh, to the earlier uh, question. Coming to the uh, current administration, the uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, the government in the future, uh, in the future of uh, uh, Taliban status in the future settlement. These are all issues that needs to be discussed between both sides. Uh, what are the ways to achieve permanent status? What are the things that we need to do in the interim in order to get to, uh, to a permanent uh, solution? Uh, in all these things, rather than uh, taking a firm position about it at this stage, these should be issues uh, discussed around the table uh, between the Afghans, including the type of compromises that both sides needs to, needs to be doing. Uh, the, uh, if there is one lesson uh, in the peace processes around the world, uh, no peace process has succeeded uh, with one side making compromises. Uh, and and, and uh, 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 if there are compromises, these, these have to be on both sides uh, for the sake of the common interest of the broader public in the whole uh, nation. Uh, and, and that's what we are looking looking forward to. Uh, certainly there needs to be compromises if there is uh, a need for uh, for for for, uh, for uh, changes uh, in the system. Personally, uh, I myself and my political uh, background, uh, I have uh, politically I fought for a for a for a different system of governance uh, and for amendment of the constitution, but I have fought for it peacefully. Uh, and, and, and through peaceful uh, means. Uh, so if we could agree on the rules uh, of the game that we will not, uh, we will not uh, resort to violence or, or, or seek support from terrorist groups in order to achieve political ob objectives, but rather uh, fight for our, uh, for our uh, uh, ideas. Politically, that will be, uh, that will be I, I think, a turning point uh, after four, four decades of, uh, uh, of war. But at the same time, I, I, I emphasized on inclusivity. When I say inclusive, it doesn't mean it has to be inclusive of us here in Kabul and it's not representing the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, but not Taliban as a, as a reality in the country. So uh, we, uh, we believe in engagement uh, and uh, in interactions in working together, when we say inclusive, we say all. In, uh, we believe that uh, that uh, uh, all inclusive. And uh, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, 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 the political elite uh, uh, here, and uh, also political forces, have shown that uh, uh, in also the recent uh, 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 agreement signed between between us. Uh, in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, we had extreme differences, but at the same time, we didn't take it beyond a certain point. Uh, and then eventually, for the sake of the interests of the country, uh, we signed an agreement. That's what we need to do uh, together with the Taliban. Uh, when we say dignified peace, we, 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 we say uh, it has to be dignified for the Taliban as well. When we say just peace, it's not just for us. Uh, uh, here in Kabul, uh, but uh, for, but for all those involved. Thank you. Maybe related to that very specific question from Akbar Sarri asks: If the Taliban propose an interim government, is the Afghan government prepared to accept it? Uh, it looks hypothetical. Uh, let's uh, uh, get to the negotiating table. Let's talk there. If, if, if they say an interim government for the sake of creation of an interim government, that's, that, has a, that has a different meaning. If it is, uh, uh, let's get there 
and and everybody has to be free to raise any proposal and we have to be flexible uh, in our in, in our thoughts but uh, the uh, nothing should derail us from uh, from from uh, uh, from getting to uh, uh, a durable in lasting achieving lasting acceptable peace when i say acceptable again uh, i mean for for all of us for all afghans uh, including taliban um we have a lot of questions about the region and uh and uh, uh, including uh, jeff brass asks how has the new phase of great power competition affected the peace process um, other viewers have asked about recent discussions with iran and if you can address the role played by pakistan regarding the peace process Uh, I mentioned earlier that it's uh, while the consequences of the continuation of uh, the situation in Afghanistan uh, will affect everybody in the region and beyond, at the same time, we are also being affected uh, by global developments and relations between big powers, uh, countries of the region, and, and so on and so forth. So the uh, I mentioned in my earlier remarks also to engage the region constructively uh, because if the country is, you mentioned the Islamic Republic of uh, Pakistan, the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, uh, both those countries have leverages, uh, some leverages over, over, over the Taliban. If those leverages are used in a constructive way, uh, that will be helpful. Recently, there was a high level um, uh, delegation from the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, led by General Bajwa, uh, they um, they promised their support uh, for 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 achieving a peaceful settlement in Afghanistan. Uh, those will be good messages, and the right messages uh, needs to be given to uh, to to all sides, but also to to the Taliban. And, and uh, so, to engage the countries of the region. Uh, in continued engagement, so they, not, they do not see peaceful settlement as a threat to themselves, but rather an opportunity for working together uh, with a friendly uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, that, that's, that is the aim and the focus of uh, uh, our, uh, our efforts. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in the calculation or in the calculus made by different countries, their relations with the United States is a factor. Uh, the relations between different countries of the region uh, uh, are factors which they will consider. Uh, but uh, in our uh, uh, role uh, here in Afghanistan, we need the support of everybody. Is everybody ready to support or to render its support? What are their concerns? What are their legitimate concerns? What are their ambitions? What are their realistic expectations? What are their unrealistic expectations? Uh, so uh, th th those are the things that we need to we need to take into account uh, while while working together with our neighboring countries to assure them that peaceful Afghanistan is in the interest of everybody. Thank you. Um, we have several viewers who are asking about yours and President Ghani's respective roles in the peace process. Uh, Hamid Mohammadi, for example, asks who has ultimate decision making authority when it comes to decision making related to peace and what yeah and what happens if the president does not agree with the decision made by the hcnr the uh, uh, the council will be inclusive it will not be like just uh, myself appointing people it will be uh, it will be inclusive it will be diverse uh, and uh, represent all walks of life including the president of the country which is currently the president of afghanistan and uh, uh, so the, uh, the uh, when I emphasized on the on the issue of inclusion, that uh, uh, that that was one of one of the one of the uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, issues related to that. The the ultimate decision will will, will rest with the people of Afghanistan. The council uh, represent the voices of the people of Afghanistan, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, all together, and it will be eventually it will be collective decision. And uh, I don't think that that uh, uh, that uh, uh, somebody will be against peace. How we can achieve it? What will be the future of the country? What then? They were, we have diverse views. So uh, 
currently we are we are working closely together uh, uh, in in order to to give more credibility to our efforts uh, in, in 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 the peace process uh, and uh, uh, our determination is to continue in the same way with the same spirit uh, and then uh, all of us at one stage will be tested uh, how serious we are when it comes to the uh, uh, to the to the uh, uh, to our political well, and uh, eventually it will be a collective decision. Thank you. Um, we're only at five minutes left, so I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple more questions. Uh, the next one um, is that many peace negotiations include special arrangements for individuals who have personally suffered in the war. Um, and Humayun Malad asks, how will the families of victims of the war be represented in the peace talks? Uh, just recently, uh, I was having discussions and consultations with Human Rights uh, Commission of Afghanistan and one of the points that they were stressing, which I, I was in a full agreement with them, that the voices of the victims, uh, victims of the war should also be represented. How we do it, uh, we, we agreed that we will have a technical group working together in order to uh, to, to, to give, uh, uh, to, to, to help and contribute uh, with the negotiating team directly as well as indirectly uh, in representing the voices of the victims. Uh, and uh, uh, talking about the victims, uh, today as we speak, we have a few more casualties as a result of the continuation of the war. Of course, the biggest service to the families of those victims and the, to the broader nation will be uh, to find a, a settlement. Uh, but uh, at, the, uh, at, at, the, uh, at the same time, as I mentioned, uh, having a technical group working with us uh, to, uh, to, to, to represent the voices of uh, the victims is, is in our agenda. Uh, thank you. And, um... Here we have a question from Doug Grindle. Uh, I think one of the core issues that the peace process will have to confront is that the Taliban reject the idea of an Afghan republic and the government insists on continuing a republic. Will this disagreement derail the talks immediately and is there a compromise possible? Uh, permanent status, how it will be decided? What are the steps? beforehand, what, what is the agenda of the first round? Uh, those are all issues uh, to be discussed around the table, as I, as I mentioned. Eventually, uh, one person, one vote. Uh, I don't think that Taliban will reject it. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, uh, one of the core values of a, a republic. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, I'll be hesitant uh, to draw uh, uh, to to draw uh, conditions before the start of the negotiations, uh, but uh, uh, the decisions on 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 those uh, on those issues uh, will be uh, will will depend on the on the on the political will of both sides. Uh, uh, I don't think that it, there is there is any viable uh, other viable solution, but one person, one vote, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, universally uh, acceptable uh, uh, way of uh, choosing a destiny, uh, but uh, how to do it, uh, where to get uh, things started, what are the topics that you need to address at the beginning, for example, continuation of the same level of violence. Uh, would it help the continuation of the talks in negotiations, uh, certainly not. So uh, th there will be, uh, it will be for the team to prioritize issues uh, in the agenda uh, and address it uh, accordingly. Uh, and uh, this will be a, uh, a difficult topic, perhaps the most difficult topic, when to address it, how to address it, how to find a solution acceptable for both sides. Uh, these will depend on the ability of the negotiating teams. 
Thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time. So apologies to all of those of you who have submitted questions that we didn't have time for. But in closing, I'd again like to thank His Excellency uh, Chairman Abdullah you know, for taking the time to join us today um, and to thank all of you um, out in cyberspace for joining for this timely and really important discussion. Um, I think it's been a rich discussion highlighting um, both the challenges and opportunities uh, to achieving peace in Afghanistan. Um, I can assure you, Chairman Abdullah, that supporting peace efforts in Afghanistan you know, has been one of USIP's top priorities, and we are committed to doing whatever we can to support efforts to help achieve an inclusive and sustainable peace in Afghanistan. Um, and I would like to end by wishing you and your team every success in your efforts to bring an end to over four decades of war and suffering in Afghanistan. So with that, thank you once again. Thank you. Um, uh, all your colleagues uh, uh, and uh, the uh, participants uh, from around the world uh, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, our uh, uh, collective efforts will lead to a peaceful uh, unified uh, Afghanistan. Thank you.